Good morning. <laughs> it's good to see you on uh, such a glorious day. Um, it's um, always fun to gather for the first uh, week of classes for chapel, our first chapel, and have Dar Huey as our speaker. Uh, he has such a heart for the Lord and a commitment to service on our campus and sharing the word of, of God and, and loving students for who they are. Um, Dar, as I come here this morning, I, I was at a wedding rehearsal already this morning for a couple of our Westminster folks, uh, Kylene Hoke and um, Stefan Hadricki. Hadricki. Hadricki, yeah. Um, his mom said it one way and he said it another way, so I'm trying to get the right way. So I keep saying the right way. Uh, but anyways, uh, they send greetings to you. You may remember uh, them from their journeys. Um, just a couple quick announcements for you as we get rolling. I have several sign-up sheets that we're going to begin passing around. Uh, one is for a cantor for Catholic Mass. If this is something you would like to do or are wondering about, you can actually ask Dan, who's playing our music this morning, so um, uh, talk with him. There's one for foundations in personal finance. This is a, an opportunity for you as a college student to work on thinking about your financial um, planning for the future. And this one will be led by Amy Ligo uh, for us. So if you'd like to sign up for that, uh, there's information on here. Uh, we're doing Wondering Wandering Worship this year, which we do most years. The first one will come up on Wednesday um, the 20th. Oh, no, I'm sorry. We're going to Hot Metal Bridge first. Um, and that one will be on Sunday, September 20th, which is a Sunday morning. Uh, leave about 9.30 and be back around 2. So if you'd like to participate in that program, it's a great way to learn and discover different types of worshiping communities that are nearby. And so we invite you to participate in those. Um, next week on Monday, our chapel speaker is Ms. Shauna Howard, who's here today. And uh, so she's our Monday chapel speaker. Uh, this weekend, we have mass on Saturday evening, 7 p.m. And then our community open door worship on uh, Sunday evening, again at 7. And um, we will be celebrating the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. And the message or the theme for the service is finding success in the college community. Um, Music will be by the Second Chance uh, Praise Team and Rian um, Griffiths. So we invite you to come and be part of that. Next week, fellowship groups all kick off with uh, Seekers on Tuesday evening, Newman Club on Wednesday evening, and FCA on Thursday evening. And all those groups will begin their uh, meeting times at 8.30. Also next week on Monday evening, you have a chance to participate in the Gospel Choir. And um, on uh, tomorrow evening, no, it's tonight, today is Friday, um, we're going to, we've been invited, we've asked to invite the college community to a coffee house over at the New Wilmington Presbyterian Church, and that starts at 8 o'clock tonight, and Dan Swank is going to be the, the uh, music for this evening. So if you uh, know Dan, or if you don't know Dan, I invite you to come over, and um, th they're going to provide food and just a place to hang out uh, on, in the evening. And so uh, as we come, we worship, we give thanks, and uh, we're grateful to Dar again for being here and leading us in worship. So Dar, I'll turn it over to you. So I'm going to pass these around when they get to you. If you're a student, pass them Nope, nope. Welcome to the First Chapel. This is an important place on campus. It was built as a reminder to us of our dependence on God. It's the tangible symbol of the faithful foundation of Westminster. It's a place for quiet, a place for prayer, a place for worship. It's a reminder that our dependence on God is no less today than it was 163 years ago at Mother Fair's founding. And those of you who have been here before know that I love this time of year because it's the beginning of football season and Brad and I can run the balcony play. And I love this time of year because I have another birthday 
and perhaps someone can celebrate with me after chapel. This is my Jerry Kramer instant replay birthday. You might have to look that up. And this isn't an advertisement. I just love having birthdays. And I love this time of year because school starts again. This is my 44th start of school at Westminster. And when you, the students, return, it reminds me that the sacred mission of Westminster is focused on you. Would you pray with me? To the one who lit the sun and scattered the stars and twirled the planets and spun the earth and filled the oceans and sculpted the mountains. To the one who sent his son that we might know a new song. As parents we stand in awe, as your children we stand in wonder of a God so great whose amazing grace promises to shine brilliantly on the mountaintop moments of life and reach to the very bottom of our deepest, darkest valleys. In the power of Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we're going to start with Matthew 24, 34 to 35. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. The second scripture reading comes from John 8, verses 1 through 11. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such. What do you say about her? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away, one by one, beginning with the eldest. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus looked up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go and do not sin again. I've visited well over a hundred colleges and universities, and many have beautiful campus, and ours rivals any of them. We're fortunate and blessed. But just as the essence of a person is defined by his or her heart, Westminster's greatness will be measured by her goodness, her beauty reflected in kindness, and her distinctiveness will be found in the faithfulness of her children. In 1999, I addressed a college audience and I spoke these words, Westminster will be measured by her adamancy never to replace personalization with bureaucracy, our commitment to a faithful foundation of life, our courage to be different, and our unwillingness to succumb to the ways of the world. Only then will we truly be a light on the hill in this valley. Today in 2015, I stand by all those words. I titled this today, What to Do with Jesus in a Postmodern World, or the Pittsburgh title is, And Jesus Said, Hey Jens, Don't Forget About Me. As a little boy each week in Sunday school, we sang, I have decided to follow Jesus. Well, at that point in my life, I had not. Didn't really understood, understand what it meant. But my mom made sure that I was there every week, and I sang it every week. I learned the words, but I didn't know the music. And some of you who know me know that 
I perhaps have never known any music. As a young man, I made a decision to seek to follow Jesus. I found the music in my heart. As a young person, I held to the notion as life went on, it would get simpler. Now as an old coot, I realize that life becomes more complex than the recent events in our family's life have only exaggerated that point. In this postmodern age, the need to follow Jesus is great, and so too is the challenge. Many, particularly in our society, are cool with the idea of God, but ignore, are not so sure, or feel uncomfortable with the notion of Jesus. I say you take the Father and you get the Son. At times, our society seems to honor a just-whatever attitude, accepts unsubstantiated claims, exaggerates unfounded assumptions, replaces the important with the unimportant, politicizes morality, champions hypersensitivity, honors appearances over substance, makes this, the simple unnecessarily complex and simplifies the complex and seems to make an acceptance, acceptance of everything as the highest virtue. Sometimes it seems that anything goes but Christianity. The ways of the world tug at the way of the Spirit. Of course, I've never lived in another era, and I suppose that older generations have always been concerned about attacks on the faith. There are some who seek to discredit the Bible. Some even call it hate literature. How could it be so when central to it is the greatest love story ever told? Voltaire said that 100 years after his death, the Bible would be rendered meaningless. He's long gone, and he was wrong. As Lauren read and Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Some cite awful things done in the name of Christianity, seek to discredit it. I'm certain that Jesus was not in any of those awful things. Augustine warned that we should not judge a worldview by its abuses. Ravi Zacharias, the brilliant contemporary apologist, says, any faith should be judged by its essential teachings and the life and character as of the person at its foundation. When done, Jesus scores A+. Of Christianity, some call it intellectual. Many awfully smart people claim Jesus. Some say it's for the weak, while many awfully strong people embrace him. Some say it's for the foolish, yet wise men and women still seek him. At the same time that he calls us, the world tugs at us from a very different worldview. The world would have booked a five-star resort, but God's plan was to move out the cattle and make room in the stable. The world would have expected a big man, a strong man, but God chose to send an infant. The world would have expected a ruler, would have called the lovely, the wealthy, the powerful, but God sent a servant who told us to love the unlovely. And then he enlisted commoners to engineer the greatest revolution in history. The world would have sent a lion, but God chose a lamb. The world would have said, fight, seek revenge, get them. The spirit says, love, have mercy, seek justice. The world would seek easy street, but Jesus said, take the narrow gate. 
The world knows credit card debt, but the Spirit says the only debt we have is to love one another. The world seems to reward popularity, boasting, and self-aggrandizement. But Jesus says you must humble yourself to be made great. Forget yourself and remember the least of these, my brethren. And near the end, the world surely would have sent Jesus rumbling in in a hummer. But God chose the humble, plodding donkey. The world would not understand that the horrifying, excruciating crucifixion could lead to the greatest thing that's ever happened. Nor could it understand that the suffering of Jesus could atone for your sins and mine even before you were you or I was I. The familiar story that Scott read, the woman at the well, is really about the people at the well. It's not just about the woman. The woman represents all of us sinners. The Pharisees represent the tug of the world, those who seek to discredit and reject everything Jesus. And Jesus is played by Jesus himself in the amazing role of Jesus. He took advantage of a teachable moment to show his uncommon love to deliver firm and specific direction and to demonstrate his amazing grace. Maybe this story should be called the man at the well. Just as the Pharisees had trouble getting Jesus, the world has trouble getting Christians. To decide to follow Jesus is to decide to follow the most holy, the most mysterious, and the most amazing personality. The story of his birth challenges credulity. By the world's standards, he really wasn't much. He had no groovy clothes. He was prone to dustiness. He had no prestigious titles. He really wasn't very cool. He wasn't interested in the merchandisers who sell the good life, but he promised the abundant life. The only real distinction about his appearance was his otherworldly aura. He had no, no formal education and no degrees, yet he knew everything and knows everything. And he wasn't much of a businessman either. He had nothing tangible to offer. But all that he did have, he just gave it away. Love and forgiveness, peace and promise, comfort and grace. And all he asks in return is the commitment of your heart. And he'll also take your burdens, your sorrow, your fear, your pain, your disappointment, your doubt, and your loneliness. This mysterious man was so gentle and approachable that children gathered at his feet and cuddled in his lap. He was compassionate to sinners, yet he spoke scorching, scathing words about sin. He was distinguished in his maturity, yet possessed the winsome spirit of a child. Calendars which record the yesterdays and tomorrows of our lives are dated from his birth. Now this really shouldn't be in the past test tense because part of the mystery is that he was and he is and he shall ever be. He left the earth like no other. He left, but he came back. You can look it up in the record book. In the end, he saved others, but not himself. His love for us is unselfish, 
unwarranted and unparalleled. Like the Pharisees who were hovering at the well, who just left because they didn't get it, the world just doesn't get it. This is about God incarnate, Christ's birth, life, crucifixion, resurrection. It's about the amazing Jesus, the man at the well, his high standards of expectation coupled with uncommon love and amazing grace. May God bless you and strengthen you as you take a good look from the mountaintop and especially when you try to see from the deepest, darkest valley. In the power of Jesus' name, amen.